Bless the Lord, oh my soul, bless Hi, thanks for tuning in to Armor of God. As always, thank you so much for taking the time to be here with us, and hopefully you'll be edified with what we've put together for all of you here. This will be the first video of 2024, and so I thought of making the compilation of some of the most interesting clips I shared last year. Usually people release this kind of video at the end of every year, but then again, where's the rule in saying you can't do it at the start of the year instead? And here in this video, I include almost every priest that I've featured in the previous videos. But before I carry on with the video though, I would just like to say Happy New Year to all of you, and I hope all of you have learned a lot so far. Now to kick this off, I'd like to start with Father Chad Ripperger and the demon of midlife crisis. It's interesting because when I researched who he was, he's the demon of the midlife crisis. Yeah, he's a real guy. That's what the fathers say. The fathers of the church. So when psychologists say, hey, we come up with this idea, the midlife crisis, sorry, fathers beat you to the punch. But they, they, uh, but they said he was the demon of the midlife crisis. But at one point, he said to me during the exorcism, he just looks at me and he says, if you weren't being protected, I'd snap your neck. It, doesn't, it didn't cause any fear. I'm like, hey, he's right. I'm being protected, right? And then, of course, we've also covered the subject of Freemasons quite a lot last year, where Father Ripperger talks a little bit about the Freemasonic curse. What most people don't realize is that, and you even talk to Freemasons like, we didn't do that. Actually, you did. And, which is basically, each time they go up a level in Freemasonry, they basically agree to take on the, a curse or some type of evil upon them and their family if they don't fulfill that requirement of Freemasonry. And so that curse, we call it the Freemasonic curse, gets passed on from generation to generation. And you'll see it in various forms, like health issues, respiratory issues is a common one. You'll see it in, um, in forms of, and that doesn't mean everybody who has respiratory issues has got Freemasonry in their lineage. Um, <laughs> but it also comes in the form of, you know, particular problems in relationship to the Six Commandments, high levels of homosexuality, infidelity, things like that. So that's what you tend to, to see from the Freemasonic curse. And so I tell people, you know, if you have that in your lineage, you need to get it cleaned up. You really want to get it cleaned up. I tell people, look, when you get married, you're not just marrying her. You're not just marrying her family. You're marrying all the demons that are attached to her family. That's what you're marrying into. So you want to make sure she's got none. When, you, when you're coming into this. And so a lot of the people that, uh, that know me and I've witnessed their marriage, the night before the wedding, will actually sit down and do all the deliverance stuff for both parties in relationship to any possible generational stuff, which I think is, is, is very beneficial. Apart from the Freemasons, we have also learned from these priests about the incubus spirit. It's interesting that in Wikipedia, incubus is explained this way. An incubus is a demon in male form and folklore that seeks to have sexual intercourse with sleeping women. Anyway, here's Father Daniel Rehill talking about a case in relation to this. Um, currently, I have a few cases I'm dealing with that's an incubus spirit. And this is one of the most repulsive because it actually sexually abuses people. But you need to invite it in to some degree. And, and this is where people get tripped up. Uh, so there was a woman who's a lawyer and she... Uh, self-professed Gnostic, didn't care if there was a God, it, she wasn't interested in it. And she had something moving around in her bedroom at night. So she finally said to the thing, if you're, if there's something present here, grab my hand and something grabbed her hand. So for most people, that'd be like a sign to say, this is a problem. There's something in my room that I can't identify and who knows what else it's gonna do. But she didn't do that. She developed a conversation with this thing uh, asking for like yes and no answers through moving things in the room and whatnot. And eventually it progressed to, she felt, said it kissed her and she didn't swat it off and say, no, I, I don't want that. And, and eventually now it's having sex with her and then it's raping her. And now she doesn't like it. And that's when I get called to come in. But, you know, it's always this case. And I, and I had three at once of the same thing. It's always kind of strange. Cause you're like, well, why is this suddenly and popping up everywhere? Uh, and one of them was a man. These spirits don't have gender, but they can Im impersonate gender. And he he said to me, in all honesty, you know, so I woke up half awake and didn't really know what's happening, but I felt like my genitals were being stimulated and he he was enjoying it. So he may, he had this thought, well, whatever this is, I, I like it. And that there was the permission. So if you're not schooled in this, like think about it. If you're half day sleeping in and out, you're not really paying attention. It's easy to be tricked into giving the thing permission. So that's what I'm seeing right now. Um, 
I, I'm not sure uh, why that happens, you know, to some degree. Um, and I like what Father Real said here in regards to those who don't believe in these things. I also think that people that are curious are more at risk because they're more open to like just testing things and seeing what happens or playing these games with, you know, whatnot, Ouija boards and things like that. Uh, because they don't believe it. And if you think this is all made up, of course, you're going to go into it thinking, how could I get hurt? It's not real until they do get hurt. And then, you know, then you have to call somebody for help. And then there was Father Fortea describing how every exorcism weakens a little the power of hell on earth. In every exorcism, the spirit inside call other bad spirits to help him. And even if you are praying just for a person, many, many demonic forces may be there. But the priest call angels, saints to help him. Then every exorcism in some way is a fight between the forces of light and the forces of darkness. I understood that every exorcism uh, weakens a little more the power of hell on earth. Every exorcism weakens a little more the power of hell on earth. We've also heard from these exorcists, which the church also strictly forbids them from doing, to not ask the demons unnecessary questions out of curiosity. And out of all of the exorcists that talk about it, I'd like to share Father John Sada's explanation about this, just because he also included the particular case involving a Hispanic girl that was promised to the demons at birth. Sometimes you can be tempted to ask a question of the demon just out of pure curiosity, and that's very, very dangerous, because then they're playing into their hands. Yeah. Uh, there are certain things that you can ask the demon, like, for example, um, how many of you are there? What is your name? And what gave you the legal right to be here? Okay. And that's an interesting thing. Now, here's a case where, you know, a person can be possessed because of somebody else. So, for example, that case I was talking about, that young Hispanic girl, when we did the actual exorcism and we asked the demons, what gave you the legal right to be here? Her answer was, he promised her to us at her birth. In other words, her father, who was... Her, this was a, a case, the father was Cuban, the mother was Puerto Rican. The father was a practitioner of Santeria, which is a, you know, um, a cult sort of practice, a cult practice. And um, he did not want this child. He disowned her at her birth, and he literally gave her to the demons at her birth. And so now she's possessed because her father had legal authority over her, and he could do what he wanted with her under that spiritual authority. He was possessed by three demons. It was very easy to free her the first time because it wasn't her fault that she was possessed. It was her father's fault. But then she didn't make any changes in her life, and she went on doing all kinds of things that were not nice, and she became repossessed. Only now, the second time, it's her fault. She's the one who opened the door, and it was much, much more difficult to free her the second time than it was the first time. So, but yeah, demons can only do what they're allowed to do. They have to have legal rights. So I can only ask demons certain questions. Um, and uh, some one, I remember one case where I asked a question that I shouldn't have asked and the other priest was there and he said, oh, oh well, you can't go there. And I said, oh yeah, you're right, back up, stop, you know. So fortunately there was a check and balance. I also have a whole team that assists me. Um, there are two doctors, a lawyer, um, there's, there's a whole team of, of professional people that assist. So I have two guys that I call my muscle men. Um, they're just there for physical protection, literally. Um, so, yeah, we never, we never do it alone. Because it's very dangerous on, on many different levels. If you haven't realized it already by now, even though a lot of these clips are of the exorcists talking about various cases of demons, they will always use those examples to illustrate the danger and what we should and shouldn't do in regards to these dangers, which I think should be the main focus here. Just as Father Rehill shared about the incuta spirit earlier. And also when Monsignor Stephen Rossetti talks briefly about how demons look like. Demons don't look like anything because they're pure spiritual beings. They have no bodies. Just like when angels have wings, I mean, they really don't have wings. I mean, they're not, they don't have bodies. But the wings symbolize 
uh, the speed of angels. They move with the, the speed of thought. And demons are often displayed or, or, or seen by mystics as misshapen beasts. They're naked because they're not human. Or they have no real personness, or whole personness. So they're grotesque. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, one mystic who I, I'm convinced that she had a real vision of demons uh, said that they are blacker than black and they are horrible beyond description. She said the horror movies that we see on TV are cartoon characters compa compared to how really ugly, evil and uh, the demons look like. And, and Sister Faustina, the famous mystic, uh, Paul, the Polish sisters said, you would rather suffer all the sufferings of, of, of the world than have one glimpse of the true nature of Satan. And we've also learned about the devil's greatest lie, which is to make us think that he doesn't exist, as so many in the world today believe so. You can even read from the comments, there are a lot of people calling those who believe in heaven and hell to stop believing in fairy tales, which of course is what the devil is aiming for, so that he can do his works without too much opposition. It has been said that the great achievement of Satan in the modern world is to get people to think that he does not exist. And that is indeed true. Even if people do believe he exists, they don't believe he's involved in people's lives or things of this sort. A lot of people don't even believe that hell exists. This is done. So Satan has pulled this off. This, he did this to, in order to infiltrate this, a, the various areas of human lives that in the past he would have simply been booted out. But this is something that is, it's done in order to hide so that they can spread, uh, spread their influence. This is why demons do it. There's something that I would also like to highlight here. After listening to so many of these priests, each of them has distinct style in terms of sharing their stories and experience as well as lessons. For example, Father Carlos Martins here talking about the process of expelling the demons during exorcisms. You have demons that you can definitely tell they're a low-ranking demon, a peon. There's not always multiple demons, but where there are, you can bet that the first one to come out is not the boss because the main possessing demon protects himself by inviting other demons in. And he brings them in through establishing greater covenants with the victim by opening more doors, if you will. And then when there is the confrontation with the priest, the lower ranking ones, the foot soldiers, those are the ones that are sent out first. An exorcist can approach that two ways. He can immediately ask for the boss. But oftentimes, for at least the first foot soldier, I will choose to interact with them to kind of get a feel of what's going on here. The low-level ones often have a great chip on their shoulder. They're on the bottom of the totem pole. They're taking orders, and probably their entire existence consists of just that, constantly taking orders. But you have to remember, a demon by nature is proud and resents that. So even though he's part of this demonic network united against God, and they're just preying upon this victim like parasites without any mercy, they resent each other. I will often access that resentment and occasionally I get him to give up information that he ordinarily would not. And usually if he does, a higher ranking demon will snatch him out and will manifest himself. When you have a higher ranking demon, he typically displays less pride than a lower ranking demon. And He's less anxious to establish his authority. He possesses authority, and he knows that he does. When I've handled enough lower-ranking demons, I've managed to extract some information, but I've kind of just had enough. Then as a new demon comes out, all right, I want your boss. I don't want to talk with you. Lord, I ask you to bring out the main possessor, or at least the demon that you want me to deal with. And there will be a new demon that always comes out at that point. This is one where there's going to be a lot more resistance exhibited by him and a lot less showboating. There are typically less displays of power 
the lower ranking demons are the ones that are, in my experience, very glad to display their power because they want to make themselves out to be important. When in fact, even in the demonic kingdom, they're not very important. They're a kind of a stopgap. Just as Father Martins described about the hierarchy of demons earlier, here's another exorcist that a lot of us love listening to as well. Father Vincent Lampard, which is in fact one of the first few exorcists I've listened to a lot before I released the first video last year. So I've worked with people who tell me that once the demon manifests in their body, they no longer have any recollection of what took place. Others have told me that once the manifestation begins, then they're aware of everything that's happening but they're like a prisoner trapped in their own body, helpless to stop any of it. The church would say that, you know, just as much as there is a hierarchy in the angelic world, there is a hierarchy in the demonic world. So they vary in strength and malice, maybe according to the height from which they fell. Certainly, the highest ranking of the angels that fell was Lucifer himself, who became the devil or Satan. And then all of the other angels would kind of fall below him. But there is a hierarchy in the demonic world, and it really is a matter of trying to understand what ranking of demon that I may be dealing with. And it is true that oftentimes it isn't a question of one demon, but it could be multiple demons kind of clustered together with a demon of a higher ranking that's kind of controlling the possession itself. There is no fraternity or collegiality amongst demons. They hate themselves just as much as they hate us, but they are united in their hatred of humanity. What's the old line, you know, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. So demons, again, there's no fraternity there, if you will, but they are united. And oftentimes the weakest demons are the first to go, but they're even, you know, kind of conflicted because they want to leave, but maybe the higher ranking demon is trying to force them to stay, which leads to even greater torment for them. So it is a great, crazy, chaotic, dysfunctional world with the demons. And then, of course, the never-ending foolish claim that Pope Francis is somehow the Antichrist. And I've shared a couple of times before from Father Joseph Iannuzzi in regards to this matter. What people who are not conversant in mystical theology fail to acknowledge is the simple distinction between the city of Rome, which goes beyond the Vatican, well beyond the Vatican, and the Catholic hierarchy, which is not limited. It goes well beyond Rome. Okay, so they seem, it's a simplistic mistake that they make. They say, oh, Rome, that must mean the Vatican. It doesn't mean the Vatican. Does it include the Vatican? Yes, but it doesn't mean it's just the Vatican. So when they say that the Antichrist will sit himself in Rome, they say, oh, that has to be the Vatican. Well, show me where the Blessed Mother said that. You won't find it anywhere. Nor will you find anywhere in any prophecy approved by the church that the Pope will become the Antichrist because he's not going to be the Antichrist. Jesus gave Peter meaning or him and all his successors, the keys to the kingdom. On this rock of the papacy, he founded his church. So God will never allow the papacy to be perverted by a pope who is an antichrist. It will never happen. There have been over 40 anti-popes in the church, but guess what? Not one of them was a real pope. They were all imposters usurping the Petrine powers illegitimately because they were never elected in a valid conclave. So these anti-popes really were never popes. They were people claiming to be the pope and never were the pope. Never has a validly elected pope ever been um, associated with the Antichrist, never. It may be within the hierarchy, but that's not the pope. Okay, the pope will never be, God will never allow that to happen. We've also learned from Father Ripper that demons do not debate. And to put it quite simply, they really are bullies. This is actually true even of demons. Very often a person will look at something from a proper point of view and the demon knows he has no way to combat that. So he simply tries to override what the person is thinking by sheer force. In other words, if you try to present a logical argument, they will simply shout over you, especially when they can't counter it. And I must say it's interesting that Father raised this particular point about the demons. According to Father Ripperger, demons do not debate. They simply try and force their will and viewpoint on people. It's not a true debate when we enter into it with them. And that's where the demon would be trying to say, I have power and control over you. And then we've also learned a little bit more from Father Lampert in regards to having demonic dreams. And to me, that's where the demon would be trying to say, I have power and control over you. 
angelic creatures, good and evil, can appear in our dreams. To remember, an angel appeared in a dream to Saint Joseph and said, "Take his mother, take the child and his mother, and flee to Egypt." Saint Joseph didn't dream of an angel. An angel appeared to him in his dream. Did somebody dream of a demon, or did the demon appear in their dream? For me, meeting with the person to be able to say, "Tell me about your personal habits. What's going on in your life? Did somebody do something?" that open an entry point for the demonic into their life. We can open up doorways to the demonic, but we can also close them. Now, the, de the demons would have us believe that, no, 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 no. Once you've opened the door, it's a done deal. It's one and done, but no. You know, humans, unlike angels, good or fallen, we can grow in our knowledge of good and evil and, and be able to say, that was a dumb thing to do. I renounce that. We can repent. We've also heard from these priests talking about our guardian angels a lot. And while that may be the case, there are still a lot of people that aren't quite sure how these angels are assisting us in our lives. But then, I've also shared Father Basil Cole's explanation about this, which I hope by now will make it a little bit easier for us to understand. Well, first of all, before I share that bit from Father Cole, our guardian angels can influence us away from physical dangers. For example, if we are caught in a flood or if we're caught someplace else and we have to get out of it, our guardian angels can influence our imagination and our memory to think of going in a particular direction that will save us. That'd be the first thing. He can actually interfere physically and take us away, which is miraculous, which according to Father Cole is rare, very rare. And our guardian angels can also protect us from falling into sin by making suggestions that we not go there again. It's persuasive and we can still refuse. In fact, St. Thomas teaches quite clearly that when we get an actual grace from God, it comes to us through the angels. And he can do that by reason of the fact that God inspires. God gives him the light to be able to do a thing like that, and he strengthens our light. When people come to confession to me and complain about their kids, driving them nuts at home, whether they be teenagers or children who are acting up all the time or they're getting upset, and they say, I always ask the question, well, how many people live in your house? And they will tell me all the, all, well, there's six of us, myself, my husband, and four children. And then I like to correct them, and I say, you're wrong. They're not six persons in your house, they're 12. You've got six others in your house, and those are angels. Pray to them. Uh, get them involved in your life, because they bring illumination, lights. They, they, they strengthen your ability to make more prudent decisions. They strengthen your ability to, to how to guide your household accordingly. They might even prevent you from getting into massive arguments with your husband or your wife and the like. They may make suggestions. Does that mean you live, you're living in perfection? No. But more often than not, they're more willing to help you than you're willing to ask them for help. Because God gave them to you precisely to aid you in the daily grind of your life in marriage, single state, religious state, priestly life, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But that takes us off into the blue yonder of angel, guardian angel. And earlier in this video, I said that our focus shouldn't be on the demons, but rather the lessons and listening to the warnings from these priests about what we should and shouldn't do, just like what we've learned from Father Cole before. So like the good angels, they can attract us and make us see that certain sins are in fact glamorous and glorious and good and fulfilling. That's what, they're, that's what they really want to do. But sometimes when people get involved in the occult, then they, they do other things of a more um, upfront nature. They would prefer not to do that, it would appear. They would prefer that you and I not believe that they exist. But once they start to infest a house and, you know, knock and, and harm animals and do other things in a farm or what have you that's, that can't be explained naturally, they kind of give away their presence. Then when they also start to physically harm you, which is uh, oppression, uh, again, they're giving away something of their presence, which is, it, 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 it takes place because I've dealt with this. And then when they start to get you obsessing about, about yourself or about sin or about 
you know, the crazy ideas, the crazy insanities, which can be, which can be explained on the psychiatric level, the psychological level, but it can also be explained by the evil one too, especially when people go after Ouija boards, tarot cards, uh, even porn, uh, even in the, uh, if you're in abortions, lots of time, times that can happen. Uh, you talk to ex I've talked to exorcists, and there are a lot of what they call portals into the dark side of our faith. You see, and when you stop praying, you stop going to mass, you stop going to confession, you open up again more portals for for extraordinary phenomena to take place. Does it always happen extraordinary? No, but it seems to be happening more now than in past times. Then finally, there comes the point where some people think that they can get out of their mess by promising the devil to do certain things for them, and then they, they basically become possessed. We've also learned not to give our guardian angels names, simply because we don't have the authority over them. Not a good idea, because it kind of implies that you're treating the angel as a pet, or that you have something over him. Um, Cardinal Ratzinger himself once told us sometime, and I forget where, uh, either officially or in a talk he gave, that it's uh, not a good sign to name an angel because they're above us. They're not, they're not equals. And when you name someone, you're kind of putting your stamp onto them. And it's best to just simply speak to your angel as dear guardian. And if you look carefully, at most of the official prayers approved by the church, they're only to Gabriel, Raphael, Michael, and guardians. That's about it. And on another note, we've also learned what it really means when these exorcists are saying the demon is inside somebody, as explained by Father Carlos Martins here. When we say a demon is inside somebody, he's not literally inside, because that would imply that he is contained within a body. Right? That, that the body would somehow limit him, and that, that's not the case. What we mean by that is that the demon has somehow gained a legal jurisdiction to manipulate this body, to manipulate this person, to push his or her consciousness aside and begin inhabiting. Right? That's what we're saying. Uh, a demon is, uh, well, angels were created with incredible intellects. Right. They are not limited by any physicality. So they don't have to, they don't learn the way that we learn. They learn, all the knowledge they have is, th is gained through intuition. So we have to reason things out, right? We'll take two pieces of information and if they are connected, we can deduce uh, using syllogistic thinking, using reasoning, we can, we can derive a conclusion. Uh, they don't have to engage in that process. Whatever they have, whatever information they possess, or whatever information they that we normally would need to calculate, they have instantly at their disposal. So when we look at the, at, at the at a clear blue sky in the summer, we see immediately the sky is blue. We don't have to reason that it's blue. It's immediate to us. Angels have all of their knowledge in this manner. And just how many times have we heard from anyone explaining things like this before? They are not limited. They are not limited like you and I are. Right? So they, they pick up a language just by the language being used. They have an intellect that is absolutely astounding. Astounding. They require no time to learn stuff like we do. Right? They exist outside of time. This is the hardest part for people to understand about the nature of demons. They are outside of space and time. So they, we, we are wired to understand all of reality with, within space and time. We are also reminded by Father Lampert why this depiction, as we've often seen played out in cartoons or modern culture, the good angel on the right shoulder while the bad angel on the other is wrong and misleading. According to Father Lampert, that's wrong and misleading because that would be a sense of dualism that somehow evil and good are equally components against each other. We have to remember that the power of God is always greater than the power of evil, and we should never put a creature, which the devil is the creature on the same level with God, who is the creator, 
but certainly there is a battle that gets played out every day against the forces of good and evil. And for the last couple of videos here from last year's selected highlights, I'd like to share these two clips from Father Vincent Lampert and Father Carlos Martins. The first is from Father Martins, which I really like what he's saying here. Prayer is poison to a demon. Come to think of it, anyone that loves to make those nice looking quote images, they can probably quote him on this. Prayer is poison to a demon. You're using prayer in order to weaken his hold, to get him to surrender information, and then ultimately to cast him out. So in the course of his receiving that punishment, one of the things he's going to try to do is, unbeknownst to you, he's going to summon another demon and have that demon take his place. Now you're fighting a brand new demon, one who's fresh. So now you're wasting your energy, so to speak, because you can't take advantage of the weakness in the demon that has just switched out. How you become aware of that typically, you have to consider that every demon has a personality, just like humans do. They reveal themselves in the way that they animate this particular body. So there'll be contortion within the muscles in a particular way. And so that's your clue. That's the biggest clue. Okay, there's a change here. This is a new demon. He may speak differently and he's going to try to sound and act like the first demon so that you won't know that there's been a switch. It's to their advantage. But when you perceive it, then you want to say, no, no, no. I didn't give permission for that first demon to leave. God Almighty, I ask that you bring that first demon, and you typically name him if you know his name, bring him back now and get rid of this second demon. And then you can continue where it leaves off. It's important as an exorcist that you only allow a demon to leave when you want that to happen. By leave, what I mean is leave the sphere of the attention because then he's out of the immediate strike range of your prayers. And then here's Father Vincent Lampard. What he's saying here is basically summarizes his role as an exorcist, I think, in one of the best ways possible. Usually weaker demons don't really have a proper name. They might say that there is a, you know, the demon of anger or gluttony or lust. Think of any of the, the deadly sins. The ones of a higher ranking seem to have a proper name. So like I mentioned earlier, casting out the demon Leviathan, in that person, they were, they were possessed by seven demons and they were kind of, you know, working together. You know, in the gospel accounts, when demons speak to Jesus, they always go and speak from the, in the singular to the plural, such as, I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Have you come against us before the present time? So again, in these weakest demons, they're, they're always the first to go. The ones of a higher ranking, like Leviathan, told me that it had a right to possess this person because the person had done something that gave the demon authority to possess them. But the human person has the capacity to grow in holiness and virtue. We can say, well, that was a really dumb thing to do. And then we can repent and want to change. Demons may try to convince us that, no, it's one and done, but that's certainly not the case. So anyone can ask for help in having demons cast out. It's important to note that just because somebody is possessed doesn't mean that they're manifesting 24 hours a day. To be possessed means that somehow the person, either directly or indirectly, gave authority to a demon to attach itself to their life. They enter into them, if you will, and then something may trigger that demonic connection that causes a manifestation. The people who are possessed can go through the normal aspects of life. They can go to work and school and do these types of things, but then something will trigger the manifestation. And because they're not manifesting all the time, then the person can ask for help from the church. You no know, exorcisms cannot be performed on anyone against their will. The person has to ask for the help of the church. And as a priest, I don't go around trying to drum up business and telling people, hey, you're possessed, you need an exorcism. No, it's the people who reach out to me who believe that that's the case, and then I have a very strict protocol that I will follow to make the determination whether or not their situation is demonic in nature, is it spiritual, is it physical due to a medical condition, or is it mental due to some type of, you know, psychotic whatever that may be going on in the person. 
Well then that is all for the first video of this year. As always, even though all of these clips have been shared with all of you before, I hope you've learned a lot as well. And if there's any suggestion or feedback at all, please don't hesitate to let me know in the comments below. Before we get to the end of this video though, I'd like to share a beautiful message from Monsignor Stephen Rossetti, and it's about something that matters the most, which is loving Jesus. He shared one particular exorcism in which he said to the possessed person the name of Jesus. And when Monsignor Rossetti said it, the possessed person simply said, Oh, the demons hate that name. It makes them very angry every time you say it. And she also said, It hurts just to hear that name. This proves how much demons hate Jesus. They even hate the mention of his name. But Monsignor Rossetti reminded us as Christians, we are called to love Jesus. The Bible tells us who was there when Jesus was crucified. Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of Jesus, and the disciple John. What did they have in common? They loved Jesus. His mother loves Jesus, her son. Of course, Mary Magdalene had a special love of Jesus. And John, of course, the beloved disciple who had intense love of Jesus. So the fear of being there, of being seen with Jesus, who was killed as an insurrectionist, and the fear was so great in St. Peter that initially he denied Jesus. He didn't want to be associated with a criminal. But John loves Jesus. Mary Magdalene loves Jesus. Mary, the mother of Jesus, loved Jesus, her son. They love him so much, they would have endured anything. They had to be there at his crucifixion. And later, when St. Peter was redeemed by Jesus, what did Jesus ask of this first pope, this first leader of the church? Simon Peter, do you love me? That's what Jesus wants from us. He wants us to love him. And so the question is, how can we do this? We say because sometimes it might feel difficult. Because it doesn't feel like Jesus is close to us. This love of Jesus comes to us by the power of the Spirit. It's a gift. It's a gift the saints had that, this incredible love of Jesus. Anyway, for those of you who'd like to support our works, I left a link to our PayPal donation in the description box below and from the bottom of my heart. Thank you so much for your continuous support, contribution, and prayers. And until the next one, stay safe, stay healthy, and may God bless you.